We're still in Joel. And when Joel chapter 2. Joel 2. Verses 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterwards. That I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also... Upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. As we look at this prophecy of Joel, it gives us the promise of the outpouring of the spirit of God upon all believers in the church of the living God. And the emphasis is on that word all. As we have been looking on the feeling or the oppression or the dynamite of the Holy Ghost, in the lives of many people, we have seen that in the Old Testament, people like Moses, Joshua, Samson, Samuel, David, and also the prophets, that they were filled with the Holy Ghost, controlled by the Holy Ghost. In fact, it says, holy men of God, they moved as they spoke, as they were moved of the Holy Ghost. But the difference is, in the Old Testament time. You have isolated, selected people that had the Holy Ghost on them. The peculiar thing in this promise we're looking at is that it says, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Actually, that had been the dream in the heart of Moses in Numbers chapter 11. Reading there in verse 29, as he cried out and he declared his wish, his wish, his desire. And Moses said unto him, and be as thou for my sake, would God, if it were please God, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord will put a spirit upon them. And now Joel comes and he says, that wish, that desire in the heart of Moses, that God will pour out a spirit upon all flesh, that a time is coming. Afterward, he said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And it is your privilege, if you are a child of God, and you want to really serve the Lord without any human weakness and without any human frailty. You want the power of God upon your life. That promise is unto you and to your children, even as many to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The peculiar thing here is that everything, that God has in the Holy Ghost is now available to everyone. Now, you need to understand that the prophecy of Joel had an historical fulfillment because we read in Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Notice that word, all. And notice the word, all, all with one accord in one place. You know, sometimes when you read the promise of God, you really have to understand as to check up all the other references to see the qualifications and to see the things that will determine the perimeter, the territory, the conditions that we need to fulfill before we receive them. Because, you know, if you just read Joel, that it shall come to pass, afterward, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh, then you'll think there's no discrimination. All flesh, sinful flesh, immoral flesh, adding flesh, disobedient flesh, all flesh. God says, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. But brothers and sisters, as you look at the fulfillment, then you understand when God says all flesh, that all flesh is still in line with the revelation of the totality of the word of God. They were all with one accord in one place. There's the unity of spirit here. Unity of purpose here. Unity of intention here. There's a unity in obedience to the Lord here. Waiting for the promise of the Father. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And you know Jesus Christ had other disciples. In fact, Paul said at a time that Jesus appeared to more than 500 of his disciples as I rose from the dead. But only 120 were here. I about 380. They were believers too. They had the promise too. But they were not there. 
and the speed didn't come upon them, that tells you then there's a perimeter. That tells you then there are conditions. That tells you then there are terms that must be fulfilled before we partake of that promise to the all flesh. It tells us then in verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where it was sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon them or upon them, each of them. And they were all filled, all that were there, all that were saved, all that were sanctified, all that in obedience prayed according to the word of Christ. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with all the tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. You understand? The promise we're looking at, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. To start with, we wouldn't even be Christians at all if it were not for the gracious work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It was the Spirit that convicted us of sin. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, you will not be able to receive the Holy Spirit. But the Comforter, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. Conviction for sin comes by the Holy Ghost. How about a conversion? Except a man be born again. Born of water and of the spirit. He cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You understand then? It's by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We are born again. And immediately we are born again. The spirit bears witness with our heart. That we are the children of God. And after we are born again, we become new creatures in Christ. How is that transformation of life possible? You understand? It says... The, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. And then it tells us, as it goes on, that it's also peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. It is the Holy Spirit that produces the Christian character in the believer. But then, the Holy Spirit's work does not stop at conversion. Neither does it stop at getting us the Christian life Christian character, Christian conduct. It moves on, and then there's a time when we now come before the Lord, wanting to claim the promise of the Father. And we're filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the Holy Ghost, empowered by the Holy Ghost, energized by the Holy Ghost, enabled for ministry by the Holy Ghost. That's what we're looking at today, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, the promise. Number two is the power. Number three, the prayer and the preparation. Number one, the promise of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Number two, the power for believers who are sanctified. Number three, prayer and preparation for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let's start from number one. The promise of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Come back to Joel again. And see the, uh, the expression of the promise in the prophecy that God gave to everyone. And it, there's, a, there's an historical fulfillment and a dispensational fulfillment. Historically, on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. But dispensationally, for the church. And then all through the age of the church. And then after the church has been taken away. The people of Israel are still going to have the fulfillment of this. Because if you read the following verses, you will see. At that time, when the Lord will have taken the church away, there will still be the dispensational fulfillment upon the people of Israel. Come back to Joel chapter 2 verse 28. And it shall come to pass unto to watch, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Also upon, my, upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Have you noticed how many times the Lord said, I will, I will. It's a decision by the Lord. And the counsel of the Lord shall stand. And there is nothing that can hinder the Lord from doing what he, he proposes to do. What he determines to do. Actually, this promise of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is so very significant. John the Baptist repeats it for us. 
And Jesus Christ in the New Testament repeats this for us. In the last words of Jesus to his own disciples, he gave them the promise and he encouraged them they ought to wait, they ought to tarry and pray until they received the experience. Look at the New Testament expression of the promise of the Lord to fulfill this for the children of God, for the disciples of the Lord, for those who are saved, those who are sanctified. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 11. I indeed baptize you with what unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. By the way, do you know that word baptize? It means to immerse into liquid. When you take an object, take a cup for example, and you immerse, you dip, you put that cup into a drum, a bucket of water. That bucket is baptized in that water. But at the same time that you dip in master cup in water, you fill that cup with water. That, that's what it means. You are filled with the Holy Ghost. You are immersed in the Holy Ghost. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Have you noticed it says, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire is, uh, is kind of an emblem, a symbol for the Holy Ghost too. It means when the Holy Ghost comes, the lethargy in us, the lukewarmness in us, the coldness in us, the sluggishness in us, all that is burnt away, melted away. In fact, you know, it's like when you put wax into the fire. That wax is melted. And sometimes, you know, when, when we've heard and heard and heard the word of God many times, we're like wax. In fact, you know, that thing that's in our ear uh, that collects there that sometimes will block our hearing is also called wax. And when that wax is in the ear, we hear but we don't hear. We see but we don't perceive. We read but we don't understand. And the wax in our ears is blocking the way of the moving of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And then uh, you get back to the Lord again. Lay yourself on the altar once again. And a fire of the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And it works in the heart. And it works in the mind. And it works in the ears. Everything is melted away. And then you are set on fire. There's passion. There is zeal. And there is uh, your heart in the spirit. You now really want to do something for the glory of God. For the kingdom of God. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Reading there in verse 16. John answered, saying unto them, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the lashet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? And with fire. He says it again. You know, that makes you understand. If, if you see that in your life, it's like you're dragging yourself to the Bible study. You're dragging yourself to the, uh, to the worship. You're dragging yourself to the house fellowship. You're dragging yourself to even read your Bible and to have quiet time. You're dragging yourself to the service of the Lord. It's like, you know, you're sluggish and you're dragging your feet. It's like, you know, we're tired. When will all this service to God end? When will the rapture take place? When shall we all stop all this? What you need is the Holy Ghost fire. So that when the Lord immerses you, your heart, your spirit, your soul, your mind, everything in you, immerses you in the Holy Ghost and fire. All that lukewarmness, all that lethargy, all that tiredness, everything will vanish away. In John chapter 1. John chapter 1, reading from verse 33. It says, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he that baptizeth, that deepeth, that immerses, that surrounds, that pours the Holy Ghost on you. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. It's wonderful to you know that the loving Jesus who saved us and the Jesus who loves us so much, who has given us salvation. Who has given us sanctification. Who has given us all things to enjoy. It is the same Jesus who will baptize us. Immerse us 
in the Holy Ghost. It's a wonderful promise. But you know, this wonderful promise is spoken about in various ways. There are various expressions that are used in the Bible concerning this immersion, baptism, outpouring of the Holy Ghost. One, it, it uses this word that we're believing about. It uses the word baptize. And I told you already, it means to immerse you in the Holy Ghost. It's like it's looking at the Holy Ghost like an ocean. And then he sees that you need freshness. You are dry within. You are dry in your heart. You are weary and you, everything is, is like, you know, it's like almost fainting. And then he dips you into that ocean. Oh, the refreshing and the renewal and the revival that comes into your, into your life. You, are, you come alive again because he immerses you. He baptizes you. Or it's like maybe you are cold. And then the fire is there. And the flame is burning. And the temperature is very high. And it passes you through that fire. And you are never the same again in your life. In, in Acts chapter 1 verse 5. Acts 1 5. For John truly baptized with, with water. But he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. That's one expression. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Ghost. Number two. He also uses the expression receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 2 of Acts. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission removal of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The same thing. It's a gift. You are not earning it. You are not working for it. Only you get saved and then you get sanctified, and then you can come. It's a gift made available for all saved, sanctified children of God. But there's another expression in the word of God. It, it's referred to as receiving power from on high. Receiving power, the power of the Holy Ghost. In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Behold, I sent the promise of my Father upon you, but Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued, clothed with power from on high. Hey, that's another language that is used, another expression that is used for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. I'm sure you know this um, familiar passage in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Number one, it's called being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Number two, it's referred to as receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Number three, it's referred to as receiving power to be witnesses. Number four, it's referred to as being filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But then number five is, re is referred to as having the Spirit come on you. Having the Spirit fall on you. Having the Spirit poured out on you. It tells us in, in uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out out my spirit upon all flesh. You see the expression there? I will pour out, pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Uh, wh what impression does that give you? It gives you the impression of having just a bucket down there, and then you have a bigger drum, a bigger bucket of water, and the, the bucket down there is empty, but it's clean. And then you pour the water into that bucket until it is full and overflowing. And that's what the Lord says, bring your empty vessels, not a few. Clean up that vessel. Make it pure. Make it, make it clean. Make sure you are saved. Make sure you are sanctified. That your heart, like that empty bucket, is clean and pure, ready to receive the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But it's also referred to as the Spirit falling upon us. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Acts of the apostles chapter 11 reading there in verse 15 acts 11 and 15 it says and as i began to speak the holy ghost fell on them as on us 
at the beginning how ready those people were. Here we are gathered, ready to hear everything that you have for us. It is must, that must be a special congregation. It didn't even wait for the time of prayer. And it was soaking in, sinking in the word of God. Receiving the word of God. And as they were all concentrated on the word, with full rapt attention. And, and they were desirous that whatever the Lord had for them, oh God, whatever it is, give it to us. Peter was even still speaking to them. And then the Holy Ghost fell on them. And the Lord is a faithful God. And he's still faithful today. I said he's still faithful today. And as we're waiting and we're expecting, the Lord will pour out his spirit upon us in Jesus' name. The faithfulness of the Lord in fulfilling all his promises abideth forever. And it's from morning till morning, from generation to generation. He was faithful to the old time disciples. And he's still faithful today. He will not fail. He cannot fail. All the promises of the Lord are yes and amen in Christ. To all true believers who come to him in faith, believing. I'm sure you are believing the Lord. And the Lord will not fail you. The Lord will not disappoint you. In John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Verse 26. But the Comforter. Or that, that's why we need the Holy Ghost. And there are many things that happen in life. That uh, even the closest person to you will not be able to comfort you. And uh, they try to comfort you, but uh, their words are dry. Uh, their words do, do not reach the very source and the very spot of your sorrow, of your confusion, of your problem. But if you are filled with the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Ghost will begin to tell you things, will begin to say things unto you that uh, you are comforted. There's peace in your heart. There's peace in your soul. Even though everything is turbulent around you, that's why you need the Holy Ghost. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And there are not many things. And there are many things we cannot teach you point by point. And we teach about, about this, about this, about that. And you still have to take those things and apply them to the details of your life. And when questions come in your mind, why has this happened? Why has that happened? When confusion rises up in your home, in your family, what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about that? When you have sought counseling from almost everybody, uh, pastor, preachers, coordinators everywhere, and yet it's like uh, the counseling has not really touched the point where you are hurting. When everything is upside down in your life and you are meditating and uh, ruminating and saying, what am I going to do? It's when you have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. He will teach you all things. Not only that, he will bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. How many times, even those of us who are preachers, uh, we were preaching the word, we were preaching the word, and then we say something. And then we're looking for the reference, the chapter and the verse where that, play, where that reference is. And we cannot find, or uh, maybe you have prepared an outline. And you see your outline, and you have written a wrong reference unknowingly and now you 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 are preaching and then you open and as you read you see that's not the reference we're looking for and then you don't remember and you cannot remember and that's why we need the holy ghost it says that comforter the holy ghost when he comes he will teach you all things all things all things all things there will be no area of your life where you will lack a solution to a problem or lack an answer to a question. Or lack an enlightenment to a naughty problem in your life. He will teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Uh, you know, when the devil strikes. When the devil tempts. When the devil brings problems in our lives. Sometimes the Bible is not in our hand. When our enemies come at us. And they come against us. Sometimes it's not Bible study time. And for you to remember the exact word that will just come to you and settle you and make you a solid standing Christian. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, there are some of these people, they think that when you have the Holy Ghost, it's just to shake, it's to dance, or it's to jerk. They have the Holy Ghost, they think it's only to talk in tongues. And when confusion comes to their lives, they don't remember any scripture. 
In fact, they easily go into false doctrine with all their speaking in tongues. You know, the beauty of the experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost says that it brings all things to your remembrance. And it, not only that, it teaches you all things. And then that's, that's why we need the Holy Ghost. And I'm trusting God. I'm trusting God. The Lord will give you the Holy Ghost. I said the Lord will give you the Holy Ghost. And then in, in a, a look at this in John chapter 16. John chapter 16. In verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you. But ye cannot bear them now. You know. How, how Peter must be eager. How John must be eager. We well, have been all these three years, three and a half years with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's telling us of all the parables and of all the statements of everything he taught us. There are still many things I need to tell you I have not told you yet. And, you know, human beings were inquisitive. There's something I need to know I have not known. There's something that my teacher still needs to tell me he has not told me. It's like my master, my teacher is, uh, you know, there's something that, there's something he has in mind. He needs to tell me. He has not told me. And what a kind of, what eagerness they had. When Jesus told them, he said, you know what? I have some believe in you. I told you a lot. But I still things have hidden away from you. There are things I have not told you. And there are things, mysteries of the kingdom. Peter as close as you are. John, as close as you are, there are things I have refused to tell you. But, how be it in verse 13 when he, the spirit of truth has come. He will guide into all, he said, into all truth. You must wait until that spirit comes. I don't know about you, but if you are like Peter, you're like John, like all those people, they were so eager. No wonder they were waiting in the upper room. That thing the Lord has not said. That sin the Lord has not revealed. That sin that he has kept secret away from us. We want to know it. Isn't the Lord telling you that although you've come to the Bible study, although you've come to the worship, although you've read the Bible through maybe how many times now, and there's still some things concerning your life, concerning your family, concerning your future, concerning your, everything about you. There are still some things I have not told you. But... When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, when the Comforter comes to you, he will guide you into all those things that are truthful, that I have not told you for. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. And he shall glorify me with a minute. He shall glorify me. All these uh, Holy Ghost men, Holy Ghost preachers, Holy Ghost deliverance ministers, glorifying themselves, even glorifying the Holy Ghost, exalting the Holy Ghost, and they relegate Jesus Christ to the background. And all they talk about is what they have, what they do, what they possess. All they talk about is the gift they have got. And it appears that their own baptism in the Holy Spirit is glorifying self. That's not the Holy Ghost. But when he's come, he'll not glorify himself. He'll not glorify man. What's man? What's man? He'll not glorify man. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Well, very clearly you have seen that when you have the Holy Ghost, it's really a great, great experience. And when you really have the experience, you will not exchange that experience for anything on earth. If you had the experience before, but you are not keeping the experience now, you want to rush back to the Lord so that he'll fill you again, baptize you again. Acts chapter 1. Verse 4 and verse 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But wait. 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 If you know anything about, uh, you know, human beings, we're so impatient, we don't like to wait. And that attitude and that characteristic of not waiting it's from us, had been with us from birth. Uh, take a little child, and a mother is getting something done, and, she, and he wants milk, 
and a child is kicking and crying uh, because he, that child cannot wait. And as the children are growing up in their teenage years, Mommy, I need this, Daddy, I need this. Wait, uh, you know, until... No, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. All my friends have got it. I must have it now. And then we become Christians. And the Lord is saying, before you get involved in the service of the Lord, make sure you are saved. You are baptized in water. You even need to uh, be sanctified. And not only that, as you are sanctified... Uh, let, among you, look, look ye out men, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint on this business. No, I cannot wait. I'm saved already. And I'm eager. I want to serve the Lord, waiting to have the infilling baptism in the Holy Ghost. What, what kind of thing is that? I know the Bible. I've been coming for a long time. I know what I can do. I know what the Lord is telling me. We cannot wait. It's a disease. And maybe that's the reason why of the three or the five hundred that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection, three hundred and eighty they were outside, they could not wait, the majority, but there were 120 people that were waiting. Jesus said, But wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, ye are part of me. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days. Hence, we go to point number two. Power for believers who are sanctified. Power for believers who are sanctified. Brothers and sisters, here is where we need to demonstrate our faithfulness to the teaching of the Bible. Here is where we demonstrate that we're not just looking for an experience. We want a genuine scriptural experience. Because in the days in which we live, there are many places that they'll tell us that deeper life is wasting time. And, and they're too systematic. Get saved. Get sanctified. And then later get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they're telling us that all that is not necessary. God is a good God. He will pour out His Spirit upon anyone and everyone. Therefore, everybody, saved or not, in fact, they say, you know, the beautiful thing, that's what they say, about their new ministry, is that even if you're a raw, raw sinner, coming in today, in this, at the same moment, You'll be saved, sanctified. If there's anything called sanctification, anything called holiness, you'll get everything. You'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they say, I don't care whether there is a minute, an hour between salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism. What I know is, let those sinners come in. I have the gift. I will fill every one of them with the Holy Ghost. And they'll be speaking in tongues. And I can prove it to you. And they gather the people together. And, you know, they, they do whatever, lay hands on them, they fall on the ground, they speak in tongues. While they speak in tongues, go and ask them whether they are peace of God. Go and ask them whether they are pure in heart. Go and ask them the kind of temptations of the flesh they are still battling with. Go and ask them their laziness in reading the Bible. Go and ask them, they cannot remember verses of scripture. Go and ask them, they are not interested in evangelism, they are interested in making money. Go and ask them, they say they are filled with the Holy Ghost, whether the power to stand in temptation and stand in persecution, whether the power is there, it's not just to speak in tongues. That's why I need to repeat to you once again. It's power for believers who are sanctified. The main purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is very clear in the promise that Jesus gave to his own disciples. He shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria. And then he says, unto the uttermost part of the earth. There's purpose for everything that God does. One, salvation. What's the purpose of salvation? Peace. Two, sanctification. What's the purpose of sanctification? Purity. Three, the baptism in the Holy Ghost. What's the purpose of baptism in the Holy Ghost? Power, peace, 
purity power. Look at them one by one. The purpose of having salvation is that your peace in Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we are peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. When we are born again. When we are children of God. You are trusting God. You are peace with God. Isaiah chapter 26 and in verse 3. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusted in thee. You have peace and calmness in your soul when you are born again. How oh, you see that some of these people say they are saved, they are filled with the Holy Ghost, and then uh, they want to commit suicide. If there is peace in your heart, if there is calmness in your soul, will you want to commit suicide? Not only that, you have peace with one another in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, I'm reading to you from verse 50. There it says, Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, wherewith shall it be? Shall you season it? And salt in yourselves have peace one with another. And you see that when we are born again, when we have salvation, one is peace with God. Two, there is peace in your own soul. Three, there is peace with other people. Number four, there is even peace with your enemies. In Proverbs. Chapter 16, verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he will make even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's salvation. That's salvation. But sanctification. There is a purpose for sanctification. What's the purpose? Purity. You'll be pure in heart. You know, all those thoughts in the heart. Battling with impure thought, impure heart, in, in impure motive. Uh, that, that's not sanctification. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5, I'm reading to you from verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Then, not only that, you have a pure mind when you are sanctified. Pure heart, pure mind. Second Peter chapter 3, and in verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stop your pure mind, by way of remembrance, pure mind, that's sanctification, pure heart, pure mind, pure conscience. Second Timothy chapter 1. In Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience. It's after you've got the peace that comes with salvation. And the purity that comes with sanctification. That now you need power. The Lord Jesus Christ himself made it very clear. Look at, look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. How do you think that Jesus Christ who said, we as disciples should not even give our peers, our good things to dogs, will then give the Holy Spirit to spiritual dogs, to adulterers, to the effeminate, to those who destroy themselves with the works of the flesh and the loss of the flesh. No, it doesn't happen that way. He says it in a clearer term. In John chapter 14, John Chapter 14, verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, if we're worldly minded, and we have worldliness, and this is what Jesus said. Oh, but you say, I know somebody that has, uh, you know, is worldly. I will not even say she is sanctified. Even if I were to measure her salvation with the salvation I read of in the Bible, I will doubt her salvation, but I know she has the spirit. Oh, then that's, uh, there are many kinds of spirit. It's not everyone that is shaking and jerking and jumping and dancing and uh, talking gibberish that has the Holy Ghost. It has, it has another kind of spirit. And that's the reason why you need to be very careful. And you need to understand, it's not everybody talking in tongues that has received the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, 
whom we have not preached. Or if ye receive another spirit, whom ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. He said, well, and the other people, you are bearing with them, you are accommodating them, you are tolerating them. They preach another Jesus, another gospel. They receive another spirit. If it's the spirit of God, he says the spirit of truth, not the spirit of error. And when somebody is actually filled with the Holy Ghost, it will be very difficult for that individual to get into false doctrine. But you find a lot of people today that are testifying and telling us that they are filled with the Holy Ghost and easily go into error. Any error that comes to town, any error that is flying on their street, they go into error. And that's not the Holy Ghost baptism. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, for it dwelleth with you, but ye know him, for it dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now, if we are saved, and if we are sanctified, there is power, the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's the reason why Christ said the disciples shall tarry in Jerusalem, Wait until you are clothed and dealed with power from on high. Luke chapter 24 again. Luke chapter 24 verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Power from on high. Power from on high. Clothed with power, the power of the Holy Ghost. Look at this again in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power. Ye shall receive power. Uh, please, uh, let's be students of the Bible. You know that when Jesus Christ was, was with his own disciples, you remember that he sent them out two by two, and he gave them power to heal the sick, and power to cast out devils. But now he told them, that power is not enough. You are going to face greater challenges than you have ever faced all the time I've been with you. If it's only to cast out devils, well, maybe I'll, I'll tell you to go ahead. If it's only to heal the sick, maybe I'll tell you you can go ahead. But you are going to face challenges that you have never faced since I was with you. Therefore, you go and wait in Jerusalem. Because ye shall receive power, the power you have not received, the kind of authority, the kind of unction you have never got. All the days have been with you. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Actually, the word witness there in the original language means matter. Those who die for their testimony. And that means then, ah, now you understand, Peter. You have power to heal the sick already. Power to cast out devils already. But you don't have power to be able to stand when there's opposition. When somebody challenges you, you are one of them. You are afraid you are going to die. I am going to give you the power to be my witness. The power to be a martyr. The power to be able to face persecution. The power to go to prison. And not care for it. The power to come out of that prison and declare the word of God, the gospel of the Lord. Wait in Jerusalem. Because you are going to receive greater persecution. Hatred of men, hatred of the world that you never received when I was with you. And if you are going to be able to stand and keep on preaching that gospel with power, authority, and boldness in the midst of all those conflicts of life, battles of life, wait in Jerusalem. You know, that's what the Lord is telling you. You say you want to serve the Lord? You want to preach the gospel? You want to be a missionary? Ah, being a missionary is greater than preaching on your street. Being a missionary it has greater challenges than just preaching here in your town. Eh, because you need the power to be witness to the martyr. In Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and in the idolatrous parts of the world, in the uttermost part of the earth, the power of the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. But when they had prayed, the place was shaking, where they were assembled together. 
And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. In verse 33. And with great power. Gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And that's what the Lord wants to do for every one of us. If he's going to do it, what preparation do we need? That brings us to point number three. Prayer and preparation for the baptism in the Spirit. The gifts of God are not given indiscriminately to everyone. That is, it's not for every dick and hurry. A Lord who commanded us not to give that which is holy unto the dogs will not give the Holy Spirit to spiritual dogs who are spiritual dogs that we know cannot receive the Holy Spirit except there is a transformation. Except there is such a change. They become pure, holy, and righteous. In Second Peter chapter 2 reading from verse 20 to verse 22. For if after that, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It says, if after we are saved and we escaped the pollutions of the world, where the knowledge of Christ as Savior, we became saved, born again. If we go back and we're entangled again and we are overcome, overwhelmed by the corruptions, pollutions of the world, it says, we're not believers anymore. The latter end is worse than the beginning. In verse 21, for he, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it, to turn from the only commandment delivered unto them. But it happened unto them. According to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his vomit again. The so, the pig, the swine, that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. That means then, backsliders, you get back to fornication, get back to adultery, get back to polygamy again, get back to smoking and drinking, get back to lying and cheating, get back to stealing, get back to falsifying accounts, you become a spiritual dog. And you cannot give that which is holy unto the dogs. In Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 22, uh, you know, if you, if you are backsliding, and you do not understand that a backslider, if he wants to get back to God, he will not be asking for the Holy Ghost. You go back and you'll be asking for salvation. And after salvation, sanctification. And after that, the Holy Ghost baptism. But you know, there are people that deceive themselves. They were saved before, many years ago. Sanctified before, really sanctified many years ago. Baptized in the Holy Ghost many years ago. But they became careless. And they went back into sin. And you see that this real, this fornication, this immorality, this, this bad. Then they go back, they say, God forgive me, God forgive me. Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. I claim it, I'm forgiven. Sanctify me now, sanctify me now. Thank you, Jesus. I claim it, I believe. I will not allow the devil to make me doubt. I'm sanctified. God, fill me with the Holy Ghost now. Fill me with the Holy Ghost now. Ten minutes, then the tongues they were speaking before. When they, before they backslid, they pick up that tongue now. They speak it. Thank God, thank God, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost now. That's deception. That's deception. One week after that, you fall back into that thing again. Then you come back again. Save me now, save me now. Sanctify me, sanctify me. Feel me, feel me. Then you speak in tongues. I'm all right, I'm all right now. That's deception. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 15. For without a dogs, sorcerers, or mongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. If we are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, it, it, there must be proper preparation. And then there must be real scriptural praying. What preparation is the Lord requiring from you, requiring from everyone? In Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs 
chapter 1, verse 23. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. And I will make known my words unto you. Turn you at my reproof. After that, I'll pour my spirit upon you. If the Lord has been rebuking you for something, privately correcting you for something, get back to the Lord and tell the Lord, I'm sorry, I correct that thing. I need the Holy Ghost by all means in my life. Because of that, I will not argue with the Lord anymore. Get that thing corrected. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. And floods upon dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy sea. And my blessing upon thy offspring. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. You know the way you used to come to the Bible study? The attitude you had, the desires you had, the preparation you had, how you were thirsty and desirous. And you know how you said, Lord, reveal yourself to me today. And then you, you get to the Bible study, you collapse into that bench, into that chair, and you are, praying, you are lost in prayer. You are saying, God, I will not go back today empty-handed. I want you, there must be something you have for me in the Bible study today. You're thirsty, you're thirsty, you're thirsty. You know the way you used to come to church? The way you used to come to Sunday worship? You know the way you used to read your Sunday scripture before you came? And you are underlining it and looking at the references? You know the way you are thirsty? You know the way you used to cry? And the way you used to pour out your heart to the Lord? Because you are thirsty. Is that still there? Or has the Bible study become just a usual thing, a normal thing, just, you know, something that we just do, a ritual, that we just come. And then as we come, the mind is not there, the heart is not there, the intention, the attention is not there. If we want the Holy Ghost, we must be thirsty. I will pour water on him that is thirsty. And of course, you know that we must have been saved. We've been saying it so long. In, um, and so often in Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Reading from verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. And you shall be clean. From all your filthiness. All your filthiness. All. All filthiness. And the Lord doesn't accommodate, tolerate any form of uncleanness. Personal. Private. Uncleanness. Now to do with your body. He doesn't want that. Defiling your flesh. From all your idols. Money may become an idol. Idea may become an idol. From all your idols will I cleanse you. We get saved. Number two. In verse 26. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away. I will take away. The stony heart. Out of your flesh. And that's what God wants to, wants to do. It's not, not just, you know, that's what the pastor wants. Who am I? What do I want? What don't I want? It's the Lord. It's the Lord saying, I need you. I want to use you. I want you to be tender. I want you to be teachable. I want you to be flexible. I want you to be attentive. I want to use you. I want to lay my hand on you. I want you to be a great instrument. And there's a work I need to do. And I want to use you to do it. But it's something that I need to deal with in your life, in your heart, before I can use you. I want to take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. Let him do it. Verse 27. After that, and that's the preparation. Verse 25, that's preparation. Verse 26, that's preparation. Verse 27. And I will pour, I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. So is the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that them that do what? Them that do what? Obey him, brothers and sisters. And that's why my heart is with you. You want to have the Holy Ghost. There are things you will not be able to do in your life without the Holy Ghost. 
that levels will not be able to reach without the Holy Ghost. That our ministries will not be able to fulfill without the Holy Ghost. And then as an effectiveness in ministry, you will never achieve without the Holy Ghost. No matter your title, no matter your zeal, no matter your knowledge, no matter your desire, no matter your activities, no matter your head knowledge, eh, there is a level. There is a level you will not be able to reach in your special ministry of the Lord as committing it into your hand without the Holy Ghost. And without obedience to the measure of the revelation the Lord has given you, He will not give you the Holy Ghost. If there is an area of your life where you are deliberately neglecting the voice of the Spirit, where he has said, my child, my daughter, my son, look at this. Look at this. It may be a relationship between you and your wife. Settle that. If you hold on to that thing, I am right, she is wrong. I am saved, she is not saved. I know the Bible, she knows nothing. I am not going to yield on that point. And the Lord is saying, this is not right. You are treating this woman. That's not the right attitude. Bend. Yield. Obey. Without that obedience, where the Lord is telling you, you will not be able to receive this power, this anointing, this unction of the Holy Ghost. You can fast. You can pray. You can cry. You can roll on the ground. You may have night vigil. All that will not bribe the Almighty God. He wants obedience. Any area of your life that the Lord is pointing to. He says, we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given. A pastor cannot give you the Holy Ghost. That deliverance minister cannot give you the Holy Ghost. All those people that are preaching and bragging. Come, come, come. I will give you the Holy Ghost. They're only bragging. If they give you anything, it's another spirit whom God has given to them that obey him. When that preparation is there, then you come to the Lord and it will be in simple faith. That's why it tells us in Luke chapter 11 and it's reading, it's reading from verse 9. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. If we have enough preparation and prayer, if we are thirsty and consecrated, if we are obedient to the Lord, if we are sought, flexible, teachable in the sight of the Lord, everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. For if, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that say, Father, will he give him a stone? Of course not. Or if he ask him a fish, will he give him for a fish a serpent? No. Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? How can? If you then parents, being evil, not to give good gifts to your children, how much more? God is ready. How much more? God is willing. How much more? He wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost. He's interested. If you are interested, are we interested in having the Holy Ghost? Are we desirous in having the power of the Holy Ghost upon our lives? How much more shall your heavenly Father? You see not your Father? Has He not saved you? Has He not sanctified you? Has He not given you the promise? Why are you staying back? Why are you running away from the Father? Doesn't He want to anoint you, empower you for greater ministry? Or do you think that what you are doing now, the ministry you are in now, this is the greatest you can ever do for the Lord until Christ comes? Why don't you come? How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? How many are asking the Lord tonight? Why don't you stand up and say, Lord, you are my Father. I love you. I love your word. I accept your ministry. I know what you want to do in my life. I surrender myself. Is there any area you have controversy with my life? Is there anything you are correcting in my life? Is there something that is hindering me from having the very best from you? Am I stuck? 
Am I limited? Am I cold? Am I lukewarm? Am I hardened? I need the fire of the Holy Ghost. I need the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm asking. I am seeking. I am knocking. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. You are a faithful God. Your faithfulness is unto all generations. Lord, I come. Lord, I come. If you need to be saved, tell him to save you. If there's something you need uh, to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, tell him to cleanse you by the blood of the Lamb. If there is something, a controversy between you and the Lord, and the Lord is saying, drop that thing, drop that thing, drop that thing, drop it, drop it. You need this power of the Holy Ghost in your life. Between you and the Lord, you can be faithful, sincere, frank, open. He needs to sanctify you. Let him do it. You know where hardness of heart is coming back in? Let him remove the hardness of heart. Arguing with the Holy Ghost, not obeying the Lord in fullness. Drop all that. Drop all that. He wants to bring you to a greater ministry. You are limited at present. He wants to bring you to a greater ministry. He wants to just energize you, empower you. He wants to give you power of the Holy Ghost. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Consecrate yourself. Give yourself. If you are very sensitive to the Lord, obedient to the Lord, you will become a precious dear child of God. And he will fill you with the Holy Ghost. And you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then you will be witnesses unto him. Not only in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria, but even to the uttermost part of the earth.